May I invite us to open our Bibles to our study in Galatians, Galatians the second chapter, Galatians chapter 2, we will look at in our study today, verses 11 through 21, Galatians 2, 11 through 21. While you're turning there, let me introduce the subject. We had just heard just heard a few moments ago on that wonderful song where Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. And may I remind us, as we look at the text that is before us, that's one of the key verses in Galatians 2. In fact, it's in verse 20, as we look at verses 11 through 21. But if you noticed, when you're with those that love the Lord, when you're with those that are professing believers, when you're with those that have a relationship to Jesus Christ, how easy it is to be a witness. Have you noticed how easy it is to stand for the truth and stand for the cross, stand for Jesus and stand for theological doctrinal soundness? But I want us to also understand that sometimes when you're around those that will criticize the gospel, criticize Christ, reject the truth of the word, how often do we find those that otherwise would stand solid, find themselves compromising with the crowd, find themselves simply going along to get along, as they say. The question is, do we stand tall to defend the Word of God, or do we acquiesce to concede and conform to the position or the belief of those that are around us? It's called compromising the gospel, compromising the gospel. We live in a society today that I believe compromise seems to be the order of the hour. Let me just read you a little list of my research on the subject of compromise to set the stage for our message of this hour. Compromise means to settle a dispute by making concessions. It means to meet each other halfway. It means to find a happy medium. It means to accept standards that are lower than the desirable standard. It means to make a deal between two differences where each party gives up their own standard. This, I believe, is generally what's happening in Washington today. It, when you hear them talking about uh, reaching across the aisle, they're talking about compromise. When you hear our politicians on a state or a national or local level uh, talking about uh, uh, trying to mediate the differences, it's compromise. In fact, I just uh, heard, heard an article, and I'll read you just a little blurb of it. Uh, Obama lied to us eloquently. Trump tells us the truth crudely. Which is your preference, comforting lies or the cold truth? <laughs> and the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us the cold truth. The scripture stands on its own. We live in a world where compromise of ethics and morals and values and doctrines and beliefs seems to be the order of society in this era. And it is not something that's new. The Apostle Paul dealt with it in the text that is before us. You recall in Galatians, the first chapter, he's already chided and challenged and confronted the believers in the, in the churches in Galatia with the fact that they have soon after being saved, they have found and gone into another gospel, a different gospel, a different theological persuasion and truth than they had been taught. So I want us to notice as we look at the subject today, compromising the gospel, we're going to look at three things, but I want you to stand first and let's read together verses 11 through 21 in Galatians, the second chapter. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with Gentile, the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas, also was carried away with the dissemination. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, notice what he says there to Peter, if thou being a Jew 
livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we which believe in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the law, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the uh, minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness cometh by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Thank you, and we may be seated. There are three things that I want us to notice in the time that's allocated for us today in this study together. I want us to notice, first of all, the problem of compromise revealed. And secondly, I want us to see the practice of confrontation reviewed. And thirdly, the principle of conversion recorded. Notice in verses 11 through 13 what I call the problem of compromise revealed. We see, first of all, the circumstances. I want us to notice the circumstances. It's, it's important for us to get the picture of the setting and the scene for us to understand what Paul is saying. It was not long after he had attended the conference at Jerusalem. And if you study Acts chapter 15, you find the conference at Jerusalem. It was not a church uh, business meeting, by the way. It was a conference to debate and to dis, uh, uh, discern and decide uh, based on the Word of God what is biblical Christianity. What does it take for one to be saved? That was the purpose of the conference at uh, Jerusalem, and it was not long after that that Peter visited Antioch. And the church council, it had once uh, and all been decided, that, that council at Jerusalem, once been decided that circumcision was not the condition or requirement for Gentile salvation. The Mosaic law had not been added to grace for the gift of salvation, but the leaven that is in that legalism and the legalistic uh, mindset had been brought into the church and was trying to cause compromise among the believers. Listen very carefully. It is so easy for us to have sound, solid, theological, doctrinal, biblical truth and not recognize how easy it is for some little subtlety to come in and add to or diminish from or dilute what we've been taught in the Word of God. And that's what was taking place in the church of that day. Peter had fallen for it. He had... Uh, and listen very carefully. Peter uh, loved the Lord. He was a staunch stalwart for the faith, uh, though there are a few little deficits in his life of denying Jesus Christ. Uh, but Peter was standing for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the believers at Antioch were awed, if you will. They were put in awe by some of the, uh, someone of the statute of Peter, someone of his renown, someone of his recognition. Uh, they would listen to him, if you will, if you put it in the young blood vernacular. They would listen to him and hang on to it word for word, whatever he would say. And I'm sure that Peter uh, came to Antioch via the invitation of perhaps Paul and Barnabas. And Paul said here, notice in that 11th verse, I withstood him, that word withstood means to oppose, to stand against, to confront, to resist him face to face. That means openly, because he, that's Peter, was to be blamed was to be that word blame there means he was to be condemned for his own conduct and his actions is what Paul is saying. Paul took it very seriously when someone uh, deviated from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said here, Peter is condemned because of his own conduct, because of the fact that he uh, believed uh, something, but yet he was willing to compromise what he believed based on the crowd that was around him. There are times when I believe it's necessary today for Christians to confront error and stand for truth. We're in a society today where so often we're willing to just, as the old cliche goes, to go along to get along without confronting error when it is before us. Parents are afraid to confront their children. Teachers are fearful to confront the student in the classroom. 
there are times I believe that confrontation is necessary. It is uh, needful for us to say, this is what the Word of God says, and I'll not bend from what God's Word tells us. We live in a society where, based on so many rules and rights and rituals and regulations and guidelines for so many religions today, it is so difficult to find what is truth in the whole sphere of that which is being taught and preached and proclaimed on a global basis. But it's time for Christians to stand up, to speak up, to be heard, and to be seen in relationship to truth. And that's what Paul is talking about. We see the circumstances described, but I want you to notice the conduct detailed in verse 12. Notice the Scripture says, for. That little Greek word, guard, G-A-R, means because. If you're from the South, you just say cause. (laughs) But the Scripture here says, for, because, before that certain, that is certain men, came from James, that's talking about the uh, church at Jerusalem, he, that's speaking of Peter, did eat with them, that is the Gentiles, but when they were come, to, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Peter had no problem fellowshipping and eating with the Gentiles of that era. But a group of pious, legalist Jews would come in, and when they would walk in, coming in from Jerusalem, then Peter would separate himself from the Gentile believers. Peter had a mindset that it's okay for me to talk God talk, if you will, with the Gentiles and uh, be their buddy and to fellowship with them around the gospel. But when these legalists, uh, these that believe that you need to add circumcision, the Mosaic law, need to be added to the gospel of grace, then when they would come in, Peter would separate himself from the Gentiles. And by the way, Peter had already been told in Acts chapter 10 and 11 uh, in the meeting with Cornelius, Peter had already been told not to call anything unclean dealing with the Gentiles. And while alone, while unwatched by the religious leadership, Peter fellowshiped with the Gentile Christians. He had no problem with that, without any hesitation and without any division, without any discord. But when the legalists, uh, uh, the Jewish legalists would come in, then Peter would uh, simply set aside his fellowship with the Christians, the Gentile Christians, and would uh, uh, cause division, if you will, within the body. Uh, There was unity both among the Jewish believers and the Christian believers of that era. But Peter, when seen by the uh, legalists, those that were of renown, those that were recognized by society as being those real leaders in the faith, yet they added legalism, the Mosaic law, to the gospel of grace. When Peter saw them walk in, he separated himself from the Christians, the Gentile Christians, the circumstances described, the condition or the conduct detail. But I want you to notice the compromise described or decided in verse 12 and 13. But when they were come, he, speaking of Peter, withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He was fearful of the Jewish believers that somehow, some way, they might condemn his being seated with and fellowshipping with the Gentile Christians. Now, I have found down through the years, so often those that I know to be saved, those that I know one-on-one and in a Christian conversation would take a stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ, but then in some of the political uh, meetings and the political, uh, if you please, gatherings, I find so often that they will not take a stand when there's error, when there's untruth, when there's a sense of compromise by the political leaders or others. I found so often those same Christians will simply separate themselves from those that will take a stand on the truth of the gospel. Have you ever found that? I find that all, more often than you'd ever believe. I find it a, uh, a sad, sad scenario when those that we elect and put in office that do so and we vote for them because they claim they're saved, but when they get in office, they want to uh, compromise the gospel if they're saved at all. They want to appease both sides of the aisle, and in doing so, they're simply compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to recognize that we ought not to compromise the truth of the Word of God. Notice two or three things about the compromise that's described here or decided. Notice, first of all, he talks about withdrawing himself. Notice the practice that is found there, first of all, to draw back. 
and then to disassociate. The idea here is a little at a time. He uh, uh, missed eating with them just a little at the time. He started retreating just a little at the time, pulling away from the Gentile Christians just a little at the time, and then ultimately dropped back and ceased to have fellowship with the Gentile brethren of the faith. And it is something someone said when it comes to someone dropping out on God. When it comes to someone having a major, major, major difficulty and fall for sin in their lives, it's not something that happened with a blowout. It was a slow leak, and it led up to the ultimate, ultimate blowout, if you will. There are those today that are living on the edge of the truth of the gospel. There are those today that say, I'm saved. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation so full and free. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for the grace that you provided that I might be saved by belief in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let someone come in that then wants to chide and challenge or question the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then there are those that will fall away simply not wanting to stand out, as they call it, as a sore thumb. I want us to understand Peter was drawing back from the believers, felt not fellowshipping with them until ultimately he simply ceased to fellowship at all. That's the practice of, first of all, drawing back and then ultimately disassociating. He withdrew himself. He began to refuse invitations, if you will. He refused uh, invitations to uh, be uh, gathered with the uh, Gentile believers. He refused to be found in their company. Peter's weak, vacillating condition, convictions allowed him to simply compromise under pressure. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it. This is the reason the Word of God is so important that we study the Word, that we know the Word, that we meditate on the Word, that we allow the Word of God to so permeate our lives that the Word of God is what's real. Someone said on one occasion, we need to study the Word until if our veins is cut, it would bleed Bible blood. <laughs> Bibline, as it was called. And that ought to be the life and the practice of the child of God today. Peter Weak and vacillating, Paul said, he did it fearing them of the circumcision. Peter didn't want to be seen with the Gentiles. Have you seen those that would avoid believers? Simply because they were fearful they'd be categorized with the Holy Joes or the Goody Goody Two Shoes group. <laughs> the practice to draw back, to disassociate. But I want us to notice not only the practice, but notice the provocation in verse 12. Why did Peter draw back? Why did he disassociate from the Gentile believers? Notice the scripture says, fearing them of the circumcision. He was petrified of the Jewish believers because of their stand on what they believe. Listen very carefully. It is possible for us to believe the word of God, practice the word of God, trust the word of God in toto. But when someone enters that we view as having more knowledge of the word and a deeper under, there are folks today that they have found something that no one else has found. There are folks today in Christian society that says, God has shown me something that nobody else has ever been seen. God's revealed to me a special truth that no one else has seen or heard. Be careful. If someone has found something that no one else has ever found, if God's shown someone something that he's not shown anyone else in the scripture. Be very, very careful. You see, the Bible, in its fullest revelation, from cover to cover, from Genesis through the book of the Revelation, is the totality, the plenary word of God. God doesn't add to his word daily. As someone says, well, God told me so and so. Uh, God told me this and told me that. If it's in the word of God, that's all God's going to tell you is what's found in his word not some extra revelatory belief, not some new revelation, but what does the Word of God say? And so it's so easy for people, even today, to simply think that somehow, some way, someone has an edge on the truth that you've not found in the Word of God. Peter's problem was uh, with the provocation and his conduct of cowardice and compromise and not standing for his convictions was the fear of what someone else might say or what someone else might think of him. It's time believers take a stand regardless of what the world says. It's time believers take a stand on the word of God regardless of what the homosexual group says, regardless of what all of these in society today that's watering down and diluting the truth of the word of God. I'm thankful to discover, and I've forgotten the three states. Do you realize there are three states that have just by legislation adopted Bible as one of the courses to be taught in the classroom in a public school? <laughs> 
I commend them for that. There's some today that are petrified that the Bible might be open. There's some today that are petrified that the truth of the Word of God might be shared publicly. And as a result of that, many Christians are cowering in compromise rather than standing for the truth of God. If it's Bible, stand on it without any compromise regardless of what others may say. If someone says, well... Islam is a sister religion to Christianity. Take a stand and say, no, 10,000 times no. I don't care how tall Rick Warren may be or how many millions he's made off his false, phony theology. I don't care what position he might hold. We need to take a stand and say, Rick Warren, you're wrong biblically. Muhammad and Jesus Christ are not brothers. Islam and Christianity are not sister religions. We need to take a stand. It's time in America and it's time around the world that as Christians we take a stand for the truth regardless of what the world may say or do. We need not compromise the truth of the word of God. You see, for Peter to agree with the Judaizers was to deny that Jesus Christ shed blood on Calvary was sufficient for all to be saved. If you say you've got to take Christ's shed blood on the cross and add some rite, some ritual, some rule, some regulation, you're saying that Christ is not sufficient for salvation. Jesus Christ died and shed his rich red royal blood on Calvary's cross that whosoever will may come. Salvation is available to all. It's efficacious for those that say yes to Jesus Christ, inviting Christ to come in and save us from our sins. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that salvation is for whosoever will. It's time that we take a stand in public uh, arena. It's time Christians take a stand, Christian theologians, Christian pastors, and Christian laymen. It's time that we take a stand and say no to Calvinism that says that God before the foundation of the world decided who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, and you can do nothing about it. That's a false, phony doctrine. That's false, phony, unbiblical, theological truth. It is a mistruth. It is what I call voodoo theology today. I think you get a picture of that. <laughs> May I remind us, salvation, Jesus Christ shed blood, is sufficient for all. The circumstances described, the conduct detailed, the compromise decided. But I want you to notice in verse 13, the consequences determined. Do you realize, do we understand that your compromise on doctrinal theological truth of what the Scripture says has serious consequences. Our weakness to stand, our cowardice and our uh, compromise and refusal to stand will contaminate others with the truth of the gospel. Notice what the Scripture says. And the other Jews dissembled. That literally means to pretend. That's hypocrisy. Likewise with him, literally the other Jewish believers, followed Peter's leadership, if you will, in compromise and pretense and hypocrisy in such a way so strong that Barnabas also, the Scripture says, was carried away, literally swayed with, swept away with their dissimulation. Pretense, hypocrisy. If we compromise the truth of the gospel, it impacts the lives of others, especially weaker believers Perhaps they've not studied the word diligently. Perhaps they've not investigated the total truth of the word of God. And they will believe what is being said and will cause them to be swayed. Believing, teaching, false theology and false doctrine or pretense or compromise is very serious. Others will follow what you say and what you do and what you believe. If others see you cower in compromise, others will somehow believe that you are the authority and they must follow what you are saying or doing. Barnabas, a man of faith, a man of uh, the word of God himself, one who consoled and uh, one who uh, comforted other believers, was blinded by Peter's compromise, according to the scripture. I just made a little marginal note. Be warned. Be cautioned of the evil influence of pretenders, compromisers, hypocrites that can, they can have on the lives of others. The theologies and the doctrines of others 
will impact for good or for evil, for good or for bad. The compromise and the cowardice will contaminate the lives of others and draw them away into false teaching and false theology and false beliefs. How should compromise be handled? What should be done? Francis Schaeffer's statement, how shall we then live, I believe applies. What should we do? The problem of compromise revealed, but I want you to notice in verses 14 and 15, the practice of confrontation reviewed. Notice the condemnation depicted in verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, literally not correctly, it was off course, astray, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, Now, this little verse alone counters and challenges anyone that has the philosophy. Well, you know, I ought not to confront anybody publicly. It might hurt their feelings. It might embarrass them. It might cause some ripples or waves in the group. Paul had already condemned Peter uh, to his face privately for his actions and conduct, and Peter's compromise had affected the entire body of believers in the church, and Paul had to deal with this situation publicly. You know, it's almost like in church discipline. You go to the brother privately, say, this is what you've done, this is the sin. If you confess it and ask God to forgive you, it's over, it's done. But if you're not willing to do that, we take it to the whole church, we do so publicly and remove you from the fellowship. Paul is saying in a similar fashion, he says, I've already gone to Peter privately. He didn't listen, he didn't change, he didn't deviate. He continued to cause dissimulation among the group. He continued to cause those to follow after his false theological persuasion, and therefore I had to confront him publicly. Notice, if you will, not only the condemnation depicted, but notice the confrontation described. The confrontation described. My question that begs to be asked and answered, do we love someone enough to confront them with the truth of the gospel? Now we have the sodomite community across the nation and around the world saying that what they're doing is love. And they have their banner that says, all love is good. And that philosophy and the attitude that that immoral, ungodly, unholy uh, determination because of their confusion over their sexuality, that somehow that is love. And yet folks will cower back as Christians and say, well, you know, they talk about loving Jesus. They love God. Therefore, we ought not say anything. We ought just leave it alone. There's a Greek word for that, horse feathers. <laughs> no such thing. We ought to do as Paul did. Notice two things it's the confrontation described. First of all, it's public. He said, I said unto Peter before, pros, in front of them all. He said, I didn't go behind the scenes again. I didn't talk with them privately. I did it publicly. Sometimes private confrontation and uh, correction uh, for compromise and corruption of the truth is necessary. But when compromise affects the whole body of Christ, then confrontation publicly must be the result. We must confront false teachers, false theology, false ideology if it deviates from the truth of the Word of God. It's time Christians come out of the closet and speak up, sit up, be seen and be heard. I'm a little weary with Christians saying on Sunday, oh, I love Jesus, and on Monday through Saturday, walk with the world, talk with the world, act like the world, smell like the world, and all that the world has to offer, they do not take a stand against it. Verse 11 is where you find that he had already confronted Peter privately and personally, but now he does so publicly. We need to say to those false teachers, those with what I call the uh, voodoo theology, we need to say it's wrong. We need to do so publicly. No backroom gossip. All open before the full body of believers cannot be accused of saying, well, you're just judging. You ever heard that? (laughs) You confront a person, well, you're just judging me. I love that open, that uh, response, by the way. And I ask them, do you ever judge anything? No, we're not to judge. And I understand what they're doing. They're misrepresenting, misquoting, misinterpreting Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and following. They're simply uh, not understanding the truth of what the Word says. When you walk into a restaurant and you open those menus, that sometimes you can't even understand what they put on it with the words that they're using for a simple beef hamburger or whatever. You can't understand it because they want to sell you a $10 hamburger rather than a $2 hamburger. You can't. But you look at the menu and you judge what you want. Judging simply is discernment on the body of Christ and what we ought to do. 
We need to judge and call it whether it's sin or whether it's from Satan or whether it's from the Savior. We need to judge and determine whether or not it's the truth according to the Word of God and take a stand without apology. False doctrine and compromise of biblical truth and cowardice. We need to stand for the truth of the Word of God. Others need to be confronted publicly. Others publicly were following Peter and his false doctrine and his false teaching, and Paul here confronts uh, Peter with that. In fact, in 1 Timothy 5.20, Paul directs public censure for leaders that set a dangerous example before others. I made a little note, be very, very careful whose doctrinal beliefs you follow whose doctrinal truth, so-called, that you follow. Many today would be silent, say, shh, mm -mm, we shouldn't say anything. There are some that say, you know, Pastor, I just don't say anything because in the long run, Jesus will work it all out. It's our job. It's our responsibility. We're to be salt and light. We have the responsibility of standing for truth. We have the responsibility of being on the wall as watchmen and discerning what the Word of God says and directing in the line of truth. Martin Luther confronted the entire world, the Romish system of that day, by publicly nailing the thesis on Wittenberg's door. He wasn't fearful of what others might say. He took a stand publicly. And may I simply say, we need to follow that example and publicly confront voodoo, false, phony, cotton candy theology in society today. I want us to notice not only it's public, it's pointed. Verse 14 and 15, he says, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner that is the custom of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? is the question Paul is challenging him with. Literally, Paul doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't play, as some would call it, mamsy-pamsy with the truth of the Word of God. Paul says, Peter, you made an error. You made a mistake. He said, uh, he didn't say either of those. He said, you stand condemned for walking in error. You stand condemned for doctrinal untruth. You are theologically wrong. You are doctrinally unsound, Peter. He confronts Peter for compromise. Peter, as a Jewish believer, was trying to cause Gentile believers to add works to grace. You'd be surprised how many doctrinal statements on the surface look good across many of the religious slash denominational lines. But when you get down under the surface of what do you really believe, what really is salvation, how is a person truly saved? There's some that will say, well, you know, a person can be saved by belief in, belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you've got to be baptized to complete the process. There's some that say, well, you can be saved by belief in Jesus Christ, and then you've got to do this, you've got to do that, and you've got to do the other. It is Jesus Christ plus something, and salvation is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Nothing added to, nothing subtracted from it. It's the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. It's the only thing that can save a wretched soul from the pits of hell. It's the only thing that can draw us up from the depth of sin into the life of Jesus Christ is the shed blood of Christ on Calvary. Nothing more and nothing less. The problem of compromise review, revealed the practice of confrontation reviewed. But I want us to notice in verses 16 through 21, I want us to notice the principle of conversion recorded. Notice the controversy discussed in verse 16. There must be absolutely no doubt in the mind of Peter or anyone watching or listening that we're saved by grace and not by works. Rites, rituals, rules, regulations are found so much in religious systems today. But verse 16 says, knowing that a man is not justified, that's a legal term, not justified by the works of the law. Notice the principle, first of all, is the principle of justification. What is justification? What does justification mean? It's a legal term. It is the opposite of condemnation. The condemned uh, is to be declared guilty. With all guilt, we stand before Jesus Christ guilty but through Jesus Christ shed blood by saying yes to Jesus Christ. That is, is grace accepted by faith. 
the justify, justification takes place. Justified is literally to declare not guilty before the throne room in the bar of holy God. As someone says, the best way to give the description of justification is just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. Because when we stand before God, when I stand before God, he doesn't see me and my wretchedness. He sees the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I'm robed in the righteousness of Christ. And he says, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. And that's justification in the full understanding. It is innocent before God. It is God who justifies or pardons or quits and accepts us into the family of God. Our guilt at Calvary was imputed to Jesus Christ. He took upon himself the sins of the whole world. We're made just, righteous in Jesus Christ at salvation, declared justified, just as if I'd never sinned. You see, God justifies the sinner at Calvary on the grounds of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's God's free gift by grace, through faith, in the work on Calvary. Salvation so full and free. Not only we see the principle, but notice the problem. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. You see, the biggest lie that Satan can tell today, the biggest lie that can be whispered through the mouths of the demons in society today, is that somehow, some way, you can be saved by faith, but you've got to keep on doing the good works. Ladies and gentlemen, there are multitudes of people in America around the, and around the globe that will say yes to Jesus Christ, believing that they're saved. Three months, six months, or a year, and the CIA search warrant wouldn't find them. What happened? They were trying to hang on by works and find that the fingers and the fingernails give way and they slide down the wall of lostness. Because somehow, some way, they believe that you're saved by faith, but you're kept saved by works. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith, but our works are indicators of our salvation. If we see no good deeds, works in the life of an individual after saying they're saved, something is wrong because my Bible says all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The little book of James is very, very clear that if you're saved, you're going to reveal your salvation by your service under the lordship of Jesus Christ in works. We cannot keep the whole law. If you break just one letter of the law, you stand condemned. Verse 16, the latter portion, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Notice the plan in verse 16. It starts out with a little word, but. A transition, a contrast. But by, that's the little Greek word, dia, that's through the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not of works of the law. Paul uses we over and over and over. He is including himself, speaking to Peter. He says, we both, Peter, both of us, Jews and Gentiles alike, stand justified by faith and not by works. I believe that's a message that the world needs to understand is that we're saved by faith and not by works. Justification is a judicial act of God. It rests not on human merit or human works. It is God's sovereign grace gift for whosoever believeth. By the way, you see, the Scripture says, and God says, the soul that sinneth it shall die. On Calvary's cross, God set in a plan, set a plan into action that he then is able to answer the requirement of the law, that is death. And Jesus Christ died on the cross. And in Christ we die when we say yes to Jesus Christ. And we're raised back up to walk in newness of life in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Romans 6, 1, 2, 3, and 4 tells us. 
And it's speaking of baptism there, which is the symbol of death to death, burial in Christ, resurrection to walk in newness of life. Jesus satisfies the fullness of the demand of the law on Calvary. He paid our sin debt when we say yes to him as Savior and as Lord. We are justified. The controversy discussed, but I want you to notice verses 17 through 21, the challenge directed. The Judaizers were arguing that says justification is by faith without the works. Somehow, some way, it encourages sin. Now, we'll forget a number of years ago, we had a parking lot sale. It was designed for the youth department to raise funds to go on some trip they wanted to go on. And I mingled with the people, and one dear lady came up, and she said, uh, you're Baptist, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you folks believe that you can get saved, and you're always saved. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, uh, then wouldn't that mean that you can get saved and then sin all you want to? I said, yes, ma'am. I knew where she was going. I said, because you see, when you get saved, you want to changes. You want to serve Jesus. You want to seek him. You want to study his word. You want to be away from all sin as possible. I said, yes. When a person says yes to Jesus Christ, he is saved, saved, saved. If he's truly saved, he's saved. It cannot be lost again. You see, it's the term that you use, once saved, always saved. The emphasis must be once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. And that's what Christ has done on the cross. He has filled the letter of the law that says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And Jesus Christ died in your stead and in my stead that by grace through faith we can say yes to that finished work on Calvary's cross. The Judaizers were arguing that somehow, some way, that since uh, a person can get saved, then somehow, some way, then he is going to be able to do anything that he wants to do. And that's not what the Scripture is telling us. The conclusion then was one could believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, then live somehow, some way, just as he pleases. That's not what the Scripture teaches us. I want us to notice, first of all, in verse 17 and 18, the problem. But if... And that little if is in the first class conditional sense in the Greek text, which simply means since. Since, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. He says, don't even dare think it. Banish it from your mind. It's ridiculous. It's unthinkable. You see, Paul scoffs at the Judaizers' idea that the Gentile believers were no, more sinful than the Jewish believers. Verse 18, literally, Paul is saying, if I try to rebuild the whole structure of justification by law, then I put myself back under the law after receiving grace. He's pointing out the ridiculousness is of saying, I am saved by grace, but I go back under the law, and therefore I dis, uh, uh, disallow and disavow the truth of grace through Jesus Christ under salvation. Then he says, I become a sinner, a transgressor, a lawbreaker. When we say yes to Jesus Christ, we're acknowledging that we are sinners. We can't save ourselves. We're fully dependent upon God's grace gift of eternal life. The Jews and Gentiles alike cannot be saved any other way. That's the problem, but I want you to notice the principle in verse 19. For God, because I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Paul says, I know the law. I tried to live under the law. I, it was through the law that I saw my sinfulness. You see, the law is literally one that is a school teacher, according to Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 24 and 25. The scripture says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we can no longer under a school, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. A didescalos, one that teaches us. The law is the teacher that shows us that it's an impossibility to live under the law by works. The law is the schoolmaster that shows us that once we say yes to Christ, we're no longer under the law. That's the principle that's being taught. Paul realized that what the law demands he could never attain. It was full failure then. The law demands death, but through Jesus Christ we have life. 
liberty, salvation, justification. The position is found in verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by dear through the access of faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, the Scripture says. May I remind us here, the Scripture is very clear. Paul says to Peter personally, I'm a dead man. Paul says, Peter, you're looking at a dead man. I died in Christ when Christ was crucified and through my faith in Christ in that death on Calvary's cross when I said yes to Jesus Christ, I died to self. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not me. It is Christ that lives in me. Every Christian that said yes to Jesus Christ should be viewed as a walking dead person. It is Christ that lives and moves and motivates and mandates in our lives. It is Christ that ought to have the first, final, and foremost say. It is Christ that ought to be preeminent in one's life. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, the position that I take is that it is Jesus Christ. I'm a dead man. The life, he says, Peter, that you see in me is not me. It is Christ living through me. I am crucified with Christ. Paul says, I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. You see, the source and the power in your life and in mine ought to be nothing more and nothing less than Jesus Christ. Can you see Paul take Peter by the arm and say, Peter, don't you understand? Son, don't you see? It's no longer the law, but love. It's Jesus' love for the sinners. He died for you. He died for me. And it's through faith that we live. In Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, Peter, don't compromise the truth. Take a stand on the gospel. But I want you to notice finally, not only we see the problem and the principle and the position, but notice the perspective that we find in verse 21. Paul says to Peter and to all the Jewish believers, as well as to the Judaizers that were present, Paul says, I do not frustrate Word frustrate means to set aside, to invalidate, to nullify. Paul says, I do not set aside, invalidate, nullify the grace that is unmerited favor of God. For if righteousness, that is justification, come by the law, that's rituals, rites, and rules, and regulations, observing the religious laws, then Christ is dead in vain. He says, Peter, don't you understand? If what you're saying, if what you are presenting, if what you are believing and causing others to think and believe, if that is true, then Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross and it's vacuous, it's void, it's vain and has no benefit to us at all. In the end, may I say this? We're either saved by works of the law or by grace. And you can take all the works in all the world. It wouldn't have one ounce of salvation in it. It's an impossibility. If we could be saved by keeping the law, then Jesus' crucifixion on Calvary would be for naught. We can't be good enough to merit salvation. We can't do enough good works to be saved. If it were possible, if it were possible, if it were possible for just one person to get to heaven because of good works. And we get there based on salvation by faith. We'd be miserable throughout eternity with that one prideful person <laughs> talking about he got there by works. It's an impossibility. We're not saved by works. If works would save us, Paul says, Christ's death on the cross is vacuous, void, and in vain. The question begs to be asked, do you know Jesus Christ as Savior? Can you rec recall in your mind at this moment a time and a place where you said, Lord Jesus, I'm lost and I recognize it. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Save me. Help me to live for you because you died for me. You see, we're not saved by works. We're not saved by good deeds.
We're not saved by osmosis. We're not saved because we live in America. We're not saved because mom and dad saved. We're not saved because husband and wife saved. We're saved based on a volitional choice to invite Jesus Christ to come into our hearts. Forgive us of our sins and save us. Would you stand, please? As we stand together, as the music plays, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, how will the Lord have you respond to the message of the Lord? Is there heads